because we're going to be looking at and going through the book of Colossians over the next four weeks. And so I'm excited that each week we're going to take a piece of a chapter or a piece of a chapter of Colossians and just begin to kind of break that down and spend some time looking at some of what Paul had to write when he writes to this church um, of the Colossians. And so just excited. But as we talk about better than you think. Have you ever been anywhere or been to an event or something and you had expectations? Like every time we go somewhere or we're doing something, especially something new, we have expectations of what it's going to be like. And sometimes our expectations are met, and sometimes our expectations aren't. Like, have you ever been somewhere, and you were very excited and super pumped for it and thought it was going to be amazing, and then you, were, you walked away disappointed because it wasn't as good as you thought it was going to be? The restaurant wasn't as good as it was supposed to be. The movie wasn't as good as you thought it was going to be. That concert that you had been looking forward to and paid 50 bucks a ticket to go to wasn't as good as you thought it was going to be. The vacation that you went on, it, it rained the entire time or you were seasick on the cruise the whole time or something like that, right? Like, is, have you ever been somewhere and it wasn't better than you think? But so often there's times that when we go and there's things in our lives that are better than they were supposed to be. That there's this restaurant that you've been wanting to try. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there's a, a new, there's a, I guess it's been around for a little bit, but there's a, a new small restaurant in town. They're getting ready to move to a different location in downtown, but there's this Latin cuisine place called 1961 here in town. Like the food, it's expensive, but the food is absolutely phenomenal. And Kim and I were blessed with a gift card from, from Ark Churches, which is a church planning organization here um, in the United States. And when my friend Jeff from Ark was here in January to celebrate three years with us, Ark gave Kim and I a gift certificate to 1961. And so we were excited to go try this new restaurant, this new place. And so we go and we had certain expectations. We thought it was going to be good. We read all the reviews. We'd heard some of our friends that had been and said it was really good. And we go and we eat and it was literally phenomenal. Like, it was one of our favorite, like, it'll be one of our new favorite places that we can afford, like, once a year to go eat at, right? And so save up for six months and go eat. But it was amazing, and it was awesome, and it was great, and it was better than we thought it was going to be. Or maybe the, a concert that you've been to was better than you thought it was going to be. Or maybe the, a movie that you've been looking forward to. I don't know how many of you guys are movie people. My wife is a movie person. I'm trying to become a movie person because she loves movies. And so I'm not really into movies. But a couple weeks ago, we took, the, we took Katie and Michaela, our, our two youngest daughters, and we went to go see Secret Life of Pets 2. If you haven't seen Secret Life of Pets 2, it's really good, just saying, right? And so I love kids' movies probably more than adult movies, and so it was really good, especially the last scene. I won't give it away, but, you know, Panda. And so, um, and then you got all the Marvel movies, right? I mean, I don't know how you guys are Avenger people and DC Comics, right? Like, if you need to know anything about Marvel, you can ask my wife. She's my comic book nerd, and I love it. It's great. So we're sitting in the movie, and I'm like, I have a lot of questions for you. Right? Like, I don't understand why this is happening and why Captain America, I don't, I don't understand. So she explains it. But, like, Marvel movie comes out, and, like, you're not sure whether it's going to be good or not. And the one movie that Kim didn't think I was going to like was Doctor Strange, and it actually ended up being my favorite Marvel movie at all. Like, it was better than I thought it was going to be. Or that vacation, that trip that you took. Like, Kim and I have taken some trips, and we went to Seattle not knowing what to expect and had an absolute wonderful time in Seattle. Like, it was better than we thought it was going to be. And so as we start a new series today, we begin to talk about what it looks like to, to, for things to be better than we think. And we look at it through the lens of our faith, and we look at it through the lens of, of, our, of Jesus, and we look through the lens of Scripture, and we begin to think about what is better than we think, regardless of your upbringing, regardless of a social status or past experiences. You, you have a viewpoint of life and faith and how they intersect, how your life and how your faith intersect. You have an opinion about Jesus this morning. Maybe you think that faith is valuable and that Jesus is worth following, or maybe you think that faith is just a waste of time, that you're just here at church kind of going through the motions, or maybe you don't really care at all. Like, that's a perspective that you don't even really feel like faith in Jesus is even something to really pursue after or even really look into. 
And over the next few weeks, as we begin to explore in this series, that whatever your opinion is of life and of faith and of Jesus, I'm going to argue with you that it's better than you think. So for the next four weeks, as we begin to kind of look at how Jesus himself is better than we think, as we go through the book of Colossians. And so the book of Colossians was written by Paul, who we talk about often. I just spoke about him a couple weeks ago. Paul wrote two-thirds of the, the New Testament. Paul writes this book while he's in prison. He's writing to this town of Colossae. That it, it's somewhat of this economically depressed area at this time that Paul writes the letter. The letter was written probably like around 60 A.D. for you. So for you guys, that would be about 30 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. But the interesting thing about the letter is that Christianity is pretty much in its infant stage. That Christianity is a kind of an infant religion. It's literally only 30 years old as a religion. Like Jesus has just given his life on the cross. He has been resurrected. He has ascended up to heaven. And we're 30 years after that. And so this Christianity is really new in, it, in its infancy. And, it, and it's really new in its beginnings of, gr- of growth. And Paul writes this letter while he's in prison, and unlike many of his other letters that Paul writes to Philippians or Ephesians, Paul had never been to this church in Colossae. He had never been to this church. It was started by one of his disciples, a guy named Epaphras, and Paul had never been. But Paul had begun to hear some of the things that he's hearing out of the church, that he's hearing some things that are happening. There are some ideas and some things that we're going to look at over the next few weeks where Paul is beginning, they're beginning their their religion, their Christianity, their faith, the things that they're thinking, the things that they're believing are getting a little bit squirrely, so to speak. There's other things that are infiltrating their faith. There's other things that they're thinking, well, maybe Jesus isn't the only way. Maybe Jesus isn't the best thing. And Paul begins to get this letter, and in each way, as he writes this letter in each of the four chapters of Colossians, he just begins to tell them that Jesus is the better way. He takes time at the beginning of the letter to just begin to expound upon who the person of Jesus is and what makes Jesus so exceptional. And that's really what I want to focus on for the next few weeks is that what makes Jesus so special? What makes Jesus better than we think that he is? Because there's no doubt that the people of Colossae had had heard about Jesus. They, They had begun to form some opinions about him. But Paul writes this letter to them, letting them know who this Jesus character, who this Jesus guy really is. And he begins to tell them, hey, no matter what you think, he's better than you think. And so you have your Bibles this morning. I want you to turn with me to the book of Colossians. It's back towards the back or the end of your New Testament after the book of Philippians. If you want to begin to turn there, we're going to look in Colossians chapter 1. We tell you this each week that if you need a Bible, there are free Bibles on the connections table as you leave. No no, no strings attached. We just want to put the Word of God in your hands. And so if you need a Bible, grab a Bible on your way out. But in Colossians chapter 1, if you have it, we're there. If not, it'll be on the screen behind me. But let's start looking and reading in in verse 9. Paul's writing this, and he says this. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. 
He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, He is now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Paul is writing this letter as he begins to open this letter to the Colossians, and he just begins to say, hey, listen, we've heard good things about you guys. Well, me and my crew, and we've heard some things about you, and I, I just want you to know, like, these are some of the things that we've heard about you, but I want you to know that from the day that we heard about your faith, and from the day that we've heard about you, that we have never stopped ceasing to pray for you, that we've been praying for you, that we've been lifting you up, that we've been praying for you in such a way that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will, that you would be filled with spiritual wisdom, that you would be full of understanding. So that you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's an interesting term. If you got your soap guide last week, and Kim's going to talk about that at the end, but if you got a soap guide last week and you were reading through 1 John this week with us, and John talks a lot about love, but John talks a lot about walking in a manner worthy of Christ. Walking in a manner that is worthy of who Jesus is. What does it really mean to walk in a manner worthy of Jesus? Paul says, man, we've been, we've been praying for you. We've been praying for you as a church. We've been praying that you would be filled with knowledge. We've been praying that you would be filled with spiritual wisdom. We've been praying for you that you would bear good fruit, that you would walk in a manner worthy of Christ. And when I hear the terminology for me, I think about like if Christ was to look down upon me or Christ is looking down upon me, if he was to come down and go, man, I'm satisfied with your walk right now. I'm pleased with the way that you're walking. I'm pleased with the decisions you're making. I'm pleased with the time that you spend with me. I'm pleased with your prayer life. I'm pleased with the thing that you're doing. Your life is bearing fruit, which is a Christian term that we throw around a lot. And so if you're new to church, like when we talk about bearing fruit, like what does that mean? I've told you guys this before. Like I'm not an apple tree. Like what does that mean? But when God looks at our life, when we take a step back and we look at our life, is our life bearing fruit? Are there good things coming from our life? Fruit only blossom on trees that are healthy. And is your life blossoming good things? Are you bearing fruit? Are the people around you, one of the ways that I've always looked at it, and this is just my opinion, one of the ways that I've always looked at it, are the people that are around you better because they're around you? Or are they worse off? Is your life bearing fruit? Are you in a, are you in a walking in a manner that is worthy of who Christ is? And he begins to talk a little bit about, hey, I'm praying for you that you would be strengthened, that you would have all this power, that you would be in his glorious might, that you would have endurance. Anyone need endurance this morning? That you would have patience, that you would have joy, and that all along that you would be giving thanks to the Father. This is Paul's prayer for the people, for the Colossians. And then he just begins to say, hey, listen, don't lose focus of really why you're qualified, and really where your faith comes from. That because you belong to Jesus, because you are a follower of Jesus, you have this inheritance of this light, this this light that He has delivered you from darkness into light, which is a great metaphor, which is a great thing to think about, because in your sin, and in your sin, and, and all the sin, and all the struggle, and all the things that we have, puts us in darkness. But man, when we say yes to Jesus, then we are brought from darkness into light. Darkness can't survive with light. You walk into a dark room, you flip on a light switch, the darkness immediately disappears. And Paul is saying, man, listen, that he delivered us from this domain of darkness and transferred us into this kingdom of Jesus, and that we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in who he is. And he just begins to unpack this idea of who Jesus is and why Jesus is better than we think. And so this morning, I, I want to give you three ways that I believe Jesus is better than we think. The first is this, is that He is a game changer. 
that he is a game changer. You guys know that have been around us or been with us for any matter of weeks that I'm a, I'm a sports fan. Like, I love all sports, and this is really a sad time. Well, except for I'm not a huge baseball fan, which is this is a sad time of year for me because it's only baseball right now. But the NBA Finals just ended a few weeks ago. And if you know anything about basketball, and if you don't, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a insight for just a moment, but the NBA, the National Basketball Association, has this award that they give out each year, and it's called the Sixth Man Award. And if you don't know anything about basketball, that typically they start five people on each team, but there's this first guy off the bench, and he's called the Sixth Man. That's how the NBA refers to him. He almost doesn't even have a name. He's just known as the Sixth Man. And a lot of teams have, the teams that have a sixth man that changes the game, a sixth man that can come in off the bench when one of the starters are struggling or not really their game's off, their shot's off a little bit or their, their game's off a little bit and the coach pulls one of the starters after a few minutes and puts in the sixth man and he's what they call this spark plug that comes in and he makes a couple steals or he makes a layup or he makes a three-point shot or he blocks a shot or something happens and he's this spark plug for them. He changes the game and all of a sudden things flip and so the NBA recognizes, man, this first guy off the bench that's really good, he's the sixth man. We should award that. And so they give this award every year called the Sixth Man Award because this person, this guy, is a game changer. And the NBA Finals just ended a few weeks ago, and the Toronto Raptors won, and I was rooting for the Golden State Warriors, and I told you guys that a few weeks ago. That, But Golden State had this guy that comes off the bench, and he, he's now been traded to a different team, but this guy named Andre Iguodala, I think it's how you say his last name. Is that right, Angel? Okay. Angels are a basketball expert, if you don't know. And so Andre comes off the bench, and he is a great sixth man. He's this spark plug that sometimes he only gets eight points and a couple rebounds and a couple steals, but there's a couple games every once in a while where he just goes off, and all of a sudden he scores 20, and he can't miss from the three-point line. And all of a sudden, Golden State looks unbeatable because they have this great team, and they got this sixth man that's coming off the bench. He's a game changer. Jesus is a game changer for us. That as Paul begins to, starting in verse 15, as Paul begins to unpack who Jesus is, as he begins to tell the Colossians, hey, don't forget who Jesus is. Like in all your busyness and all your thoughts and all the stuff that may change up or all the things that you think that you need to do or all these other religions that are coming in or all this confusion that may be entering into your church, hey, don't forget who Jesus is. That Jesus is the basis for better. That he is supreme, that he's pre-existent, that he is all-powerful, that he is the source of all, that he is the sustainer of all, that he's the reason for our redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The reason why we can ask for forgiveness for our sins is because of Jesus and the work that he did on the cross, and that's it. It's only because of Jesus. And Jesus is this game changer, that he has delivered us from darkness and into light. Like, that's a game changer. Like if you were once not following Christ, that there's a time in our life where most of us, and some of us gave our, our lives to Christ when we were young, and some of us didn't give our life to Christ until we were adults, and there may be some of you in the room this morning that don't have a relationship with Jesus. But at some point in our life, there was a time in our life where we weren't following Jesus the way that we should. And man, when Jesus gets a hold of your heart, and he begins to change things, and he begins to tweak things, and he begins to lead you to him, like that's a game changer for you. It should be. Like it's a process to follow after Jesus, and it takes time to learn how to walk in a manner that's worthy of him, and it, it takes time. Very rarely are there a few stories that all of a sudden you had all these issues and all these problems in your life, and you said yes to Jesus, and they all went away, and everything was great, and you got to skip down the yellow brick road singing Kumbaya, right? That doesn't happen for a whole lot of people. Like when I gave my life to Christ at 28, I, had, I was pretty much on the verge of being an alcoholic and I drank and partied and did all these things and it took some time for me to, to realize what it really meant to follow Christ. I had to be discipled by a friend of mine who will be with us next week, by the way, Pastor Mike from Fuel, took me in and discipled me and walked with me. We weren't friends then. He just took me in and discipled me and walked with me and told me what it looked like to follow Jesus and not to give up and you're going to mess up and it's okay. Hey, and instead of listening to what you're listening to, why don't you listen to this? 
And he handed me like a Christian music CD. And little by little, I just began to make changes in my life. I was moving from darkness into light. I had said yes to Jesus. I had been baptized, but I was still figuring out what it looked like to follow Jesus. But Jesus is a game changer. He is the basis for better. That when you begin to learn how to follow Jesus, and you begin to walk with him, and we say this often, that no matter where you are in your relationship with him, it can be better. That regardless of where you think you are and how close you are to him at this moment, I promise you that it can be better. Me included. We can all walk with him closer than we're walking with him. We can study and we can pray and we can read and we can be in his presence, but I promise you your relationship with Jesus can be better than it is. Always. You're always working to be in a better relationship with him, or at least we should be for those of us that are followers of Jesus. But man, he just begins to change things. He is this game changer. Paul says, man, he is made in the image of an invisible God. Which leads me to the second point, that he is the image of God. That in, that in, in him all things were created in heaven and on earth. That all things were created through him and for him. That He is before all things and all things are held together by Him. By, by Him, all things consist. I mean, Paul just begins to unpack this for them about, man, this is who Jesus is. And the whole reason why I'm so excited about the story is I think sometimes our faith just gets stale. That sometimes we just go through the motions we, if we do, our, we do our soap guide and we, we did our devotions that morning and we did it and check and we prayed a little bit and we went to work and then we had that was frustrating and then we got home and that was crazy and a car broke down or this happened or that happened and our kids, as we say often, aliens have sucked their brains out that night and our kids are acting crazy and, and we just find ourselves sometimes where our faith just gets stale. And we just forget about who Jesus really is and about what Jesus has done for us. And so what better way to spend the next four weeks just talking about why Jesus is better than we think. That our faith doesn't have to be still. That we have this God that we follow, this God that we love, this God that gave his life for us, that he's a game changer and that he is in the image of God, that all things were created for him and by him, that he's before all things All things are held together. I mean, Paul is saying, listen, everything that you have in life is because of Him. Everything that you experience, everything that you have, everything about life is held together by Jesus. Jesus is 100% God and He's 100% man. I mean, He tells us that He was created, that He is the image of the invisible God. He wasn't created. He is the invisible image of God. Or the image of an invisible God. The God stepped down to earth. Jesus steps up on a cross and gives his life for us because he loves us. And that in itself is a game changer. That in itself of Jesus understanding that he is the image of God. The third thing is this, is that he is the head of the church. That he is the head of the church. Paul begins to write, he begins to remind this church in Colossae. And he says in in, in verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that everything he might be preeminent, or in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That Jesus is the head of the church. And his letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes, and he tells husbands and wives, and he tells the husbands that we are to love our wives the way that Jesus loved the church. That we are to love Jesus in this, or love, yeah, love the church and love our wives in this unconditional love. 
that Jesus loves his church and that he is the, the head of this church. Paul tells them that he's reconciled all of us and he's made us blameless in the sight of the Father. That he is preeminent. If you don't know what the word preeminent means, it means that he is surpassing all others. That he's better than anything. That he's more powerful than anything. That he's, he's more lovely than anything. He's more beautiful than anything. That he is surpassing all others. The fullness of God was, was pleased to dwell in him. And Paul just begins to tell them that he's making peace by the blood of his cross. And I think so often, we only really talk about the cross often at Easter and we decorate stages and we put crosses up on the stage and we do all these things and we, we focus at the Easter season, which we just did, and we focus on who Jesus is and we focus on the sacrifice that He made and how He climbed up on the cross and He gave His life for us and He shed His blood for us and then Easter goes away and we take the crosses off the stage and we, we put them in a storage closet until next Easter and so often we forget about the cross and the sacrifice that Jesus makes as individuals. Because I believe it's so easy for us to just get caught up to going through the motions of our faith. That it gets stale. That we just walk through it. And that we really truly just begin to forget about who Jesus really is and how powerful He is. And that's what I love so much about this opening chapter is Paul just begins to say, man, this is what's up with Jesus. Like, this is who He really is. This is how strong He is. This is how powerful He is. And that he, he's the head of the church. And that he's making peace in his, he's making peace by the blood that he shed on his cross. Like we should never forget that. That if we're a follower of Jesus this morning, we should never forget the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. That he gave his life. That as the, the most famous verse says, or one of the most quoted verses in Scripture, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That Jesus climbs up upon a cross and he sheds his blood for us because he loves us. And because he cares for us. And Jesus is the head of the church and He loves the church unconditionally. This is His bride. And in the same way that He loves the church, He loves you and He loves me. And so we have this mystery or this hidden peace that has invaded people for centuries. And this peace that's been missing, it's, just, it's available to everyone and anyone. Just regular, ordinary people today have this incredible opportunity that this incredible, powerful, resurrected Jesus lives in us. And so often in our lives, we go searching for so many other things. That maybe if your story is anything similar to mine, and one of the things that we talk about often is how all of our stories are different. That as similar as they may be in some instances, all of our stories are different. Your parents were different than my parents. Your childhood was different than my childhood. You gave your life to Jesus probably at a different point and in a different circumstance than I did. The sins and the struggles that you had in your life and the sins and the struggle that you have currently in your life, they're all different than me and they're all different than the person to your left and to your right. We all have a story. But so often in our lives, this idea of God, we, we search for it in one way or another. Some of us have found it in rules and behavior. Some of us have found it in status or wealth. Some of us have found it in a, 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 a lot of different things. For some of us, we ourselves are God. We're the most important thing in our life. Nothing else matters but us. My relationship with God is secondary to me. Or maybe this 
is my God, or maybe this is my God, because this is the most important thing to me. Our spouses can't be more important than God. Our children can't be more important than God. Our grandchildren can't be more important than God. Our jobs can't be more important than God. Our status on Instagram can't be more important than God. Like we search for all these things. And the whole time, Jesus is better than anything that we think. Jesus is the best. He's the best way. But yet we search for all these things. And this thing that we've been searching for, it exists and it rests in one man. And this one man desires to abide in you or to remain in you. And you remain in him. Like just to be in God's presence. And for me, like this is the idea. This is how we can say it's better because it's all founded on Jesus. That if your faith or your relationship with God is based on anything else other than Jesus, like we, we've got it a little bit wrong. It's not founded on some deep idea. It's not founded on some perfect behavior. It's not founded on some list of rules or because you're something, someone special. It's founded on a man, and that man's name is Jesus who offers it all to us. 100% man. 100% God. And at the end of the day, Jesus is better. And so I don't know this morning for you. I don't know what you're searching after. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what you've been chasing. That for so long in, in my life, before Jesus, or before I really understood what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, even after I had said yes to a relationship with him, I chased a lot of other things. I chased money. I chased the big house. I chased all this status with my friends so that I could be the one that had the best job and made the most money and did these things. I chased this and I chased after that. And the whole time, the best thing that was there the whole time is Christ. Because He loves us. And He cares for us. And it doesn't really matter this morning whether we're one of our students in the room who are getting ready to load up in a van in a couple hours and head to camp this week. Or whether we're one of the adults in the room. Like so often we can just get off track and we can just begin to chase things that we don't need to chase and we can begin to make things that don't need to be important more important than Jesus. And at the end of the day, this is what Paul is saying. Hey guys, don't lose track of what's happening. Remember of who Jesus is. Remember that he is the image of God, that he is God walking on earth, that he loves you, that he cares for you, and that the only reason why you have forgiveness of sin is because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for you. That Jesus is the better way. No matter what you're thinking about, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you think is better, it's not better. Jesus is the better way. Well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try this on my own. And I'm just going to walk over here and I'm going to beat my head on the wall for a little bit. Oh, wait, Jesus was better. All right, well, now I'm going to try this over here. And I'm going to walk over here and I'm going to try this on my own because I think that I can handle it. And I'm going to beat my head on the wall. Oh, wait, Jesus is better. No matter what it is that we have in our life, no matter what it is that we're pursuing, no matter what we're struggling with, no matter where we're at, I'm promising this morning Jesus is better. We want to be the husbands, men. We want to be the husbands that we're supposed to be. Get closer to Jesus. Wives, you want to be the wives that you're supposed to be. Get closer to Jesus. Students, you want to realize what God has for you. Get closer to Jesus. Like if we would just pursue after him, if we would just seek him and understand who he is and how powerful he is, and Paul just begins to unpack this, that Jesus is a game changer, that he is the image of God, that he's the head of the church, like Jesus is all powerful. Everything that was made was made through him and for him. It's all held together by him. Like he's not just some prophet that walked the earth and had some good stories and Gave his life for us. Like he is God. That God stepped out of heaven for you and for me. And so this morning, 
no matter what you're doing, no, no, no matter what you're pursuing after, no matter what you're seeking, no matter where you're chasing, no matter what you think may be better, at the end of the day, Jesus is better. And so this morning, I want to ask you guys to just close your eyes and bow your heads for me for just a moment.